conference may begin and we are beginning with the first keynote lecture by Professor John Baines. I'm about to share his PowerPoint. I hope you can see it. I presume to those who are historians, particularly historians of the antiquity, there's no need to introduce Professor Baines. He is very famous, but just for the sake of those who might not know him or are students, Professor Baines has taught for many years at the University of Oxford, where he had also studied. He's a professor emeritus now, and he's a fellow of the British Academy. He has worked throughout the years on many different subjects related to Egyptology, on Egyptian arts and visual culture, literacy, religion, and so on. But perhaps the most interesting for us lawyers are his works on the kingship in ancient Egypt, and today's lecture will be naturally related to that. Professor Baines, the floor is yours. You can scroll the slides here or with this remote. I think I'd probably do better to be here. Yeah, okay, I'm do it sit down. Is that okay? Wait, that's right. Well, good morning and thank everyone very much for organizing this conference and inviting us and creating such an interesting program. It's a privilege to be here. And I've already been here for a day or so. I've been very lucky. And uh, I hope everyone will have a good time as I am doing so far and shall do. So I, you, you have my first screen here. And my aim in this is to take you back to the very beginning of Egyptian kingship or uh, something like that. And we have on screen an object. Uh, which uh, is a mark of kingship, but an indirect one. Uh, the king uh, probably gave this knife to a local leader, and then it was deposited in that leader's tomb, which was not at the royal residence, but in a nearby settlement. Uh, the drawing that you see here, which shows uh, the decoration of the two sides of the knife handle uh, is the crucial thing in relation to kingship here. And you, I hope people can see this. Uh, you have now highlighted two examples of fish, a star, uh, two or perhaps three dogs. And those are emblems of kingship, believe it or not. Uh, it's totally clear that this is not a realistic representation, but it equally clearly expresses some idea of order. Uh, and you can say that uh, if we want to relate this to law, which I won't really do until quite a bit later, uh, then uh, law is a, a manifestation of order. But there are, uh, we can't interpret this scene in detail, but we can see how fantastically well arranged it is and how it expresses the delegation of power from a ruler to a member of the elite. Uh, now, I just give you a brief chronology. So uh, that uh, knife dates to about 3200 or something like that in the first period listed. I'm rather assuming that not very many people know much Egyptology here. And so I will try to explain basic points. Uh, and then you have uh, the list of main periods and you have a contrasting set of periods. So the early dynastic, old kingdom, middle kingdom, new kingdom, late period are periods of um, united rule of Egypt. And the intermediate periods, of which I've listed three, uh, people argue about what they should be called, but those are periods in which there are competing lines of kings. So there's no sense in the long term that kings have to be unique. Uh, and um, yet, as is true of the ideology of kingship uh, in many traditions, uh, you can say what you like 
about how the king rules the universe and things like this, but that doesn't stop there from being more than one king at a time. Uh, quite apart from periods when people are sharing the kingship or something like that. And here's a map just to place some of what will be referred to. Uh, the most important sites I shall bring material from are from south to north. The bottom uh, ring, I don't have anything. The next ring north, Harakonpolis, is where the first examples come from. And then we have Thebes, which is the next ring, and Abydos, which is older than Thebes. And th those are important to us. And then the area of Memphis, near the juncture between the Nile Valley and the Delta. And then a little bit from the Delta, but hardly anything in this lecture. Now, we are at Harakonpolis here. And uh, there is the site uh, of the first tomb complex that we might say was a tomb complex of a king. Um, we, we have no direct evidence. This, is, this site yielded very few artifacts, uh, but all those uh, red markers show where there were wooden posts. And so there was a set of halls, and on the left and the front, uh, there, was, uh, there is a pit, that pit probably contained the burial of a king. And uh, the, there must have been enormous ceremonies involved in the funeral and in the burial. And there would, in principle, we think, have been a continuing cult of the ruler. But there's very little evidence for that. The, the site was very denuded. Um, and uh, the most important find in relation to the idea of kingship, I think, is the next one. <clears throat> and here you have fragments of a statue. More than 500 fragments of this statue were found. It's the oldest life-size or slightly larger statue known from Egypt. And it must be one of the oldest from anywhere. And bottom left on that slide, you can see a heap of these fragments. Somebody really, really disliked this king. And so there was contention over the statue. Uh, there are actually larger st statues from slightly later periods which do survive and not smashed to pieces. But it, so from the very beginning, we can say that kingship is, uh, is a focus of dissent and of violence. And that will continue to be the case. And if anyone wants to present an over-idealized image of kingship, they can have this example to uh, indicate the problem. And uh, by no means all of this site has been excavated. Uh, more pieces will probably appear, but not enough to put the statue together. And I want now to make a little diversion uh, into anthropology of kingship. And you have the uh, bottom right, uh, this book by David Graeber and Marshall Salins, appeared five years ago, both authors now sadly deceased, uh, which gives you a cross-cultural view of the institutions of kingship uh, and uh, with, with very important ethnographic elements. Uh, ethnography is a little difficult for people like us because we think, well, is there anything in the modern world which really can be compared with uh, the what is found ethnographically in what people would often call relict societies and things like that. So uh, I, I find some problems, but also some very stimulating contributions in that book, which is partly an assembly of other, public, of other publications, particularly by Silence, but also with a lot of new material. And then there is this book by Marshall Silence, which appeared earlier this year, and you can download a PDF of it. Uh, and... Uh, I think this is a very important contribution to our general thinking about institutions of pre-modern societies, but with problems again. Uh, basically, Marshall Silence uh, subscribes to the concept of the axial age, according to which in the 
roughly the mid first millennium BCE, there would have been transformations in societies in the Mediterranean basin, including Egypt, uh, and uh, but less Egypt than um, the world of the Hebrew Bible and Greece, and then in India and in China. Uh, and this is uh, what another book, which I don't have an image of, uh, calls um, the move from imminence to transcendent uh, transcendentalism. So deities and the, the ultimate um, authority for the universe moves out of the terrestrial sphere. Uh, now, there's obviously a lot of validity in that, but the types of argument that are used for somewhere like Egypt don't work. Uh, the problem is that uh, in the case of Egypt, uh, you have plentiful evidence for the types of social concepts that are used as markers of the axial age, so-called axial age, about up to 2,000 years earlier. And so we have to say that this situation is more complex. But the other side of what Zarnins talks about, I think is very important uh, in his emphasizing that the world is an, a, a world that is alive and full of what he calls metapersons. And that's a very useful term, I think. A metaperson uh, is somebody who is not simply a human being or come to that another sort of animal, uh, but is um, a being that has some extra qualities, including things like personifications and deities, obviously. Uh, because we have a problem if we talk about gods, that gods, um, people tend to have Christian God or whatever God in mind, and um, those gods have a very circumscribed existence of a very particular character, whereas metapersons in general bridge the gaps across all sorts of contexts. Well, back to, uh, we're moving away from prehistory in just a minute. Uh, but back to an example of how this sort of thing can be played out. Um, here you have a burial, which is right next to the one we saw a moment ago. Uh, and that is what is left of the burial of a very young person who was under 20 years old, same age as Tutankhamun, we could say. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a robbed tomb, which has this uh, material in it. This material shows this is a person of quite exceptional status. This might not be clear to non-specialists in prehistoric Egypt, uh, but the figurine on the bottom left is not known in more than exceptional cases, nor is the comb of the hippo, nor the range of stones top right. So this person is probably royal, buried in a royal cemetery with a quite exceptional grave inventory. Uh, but if you are below the age of 20, then if you get to be buried as a kingly person, it's probably because kingship is already inherited. In other words, there are rules of succession which exist at that point. Um, and so we can say that the charisma, power, and those qualities that people associate with kingship is focused on a line of people. But this is always contested. Uh, there's been a tremendous amount, particularly in popular writing on ancient Egypt, about how you had to marry your sister, for example, in order to become king. And almost all of that should be disregarded. Uh, instead, we have to say that there seem to be no very strong rules of succession and that there is a lot of negotiation involved in it. Uh, these conceptions and practices of kingship then spread from Upper Egypt, from the Harakonblis, quite near the Sudan, uh, sorry, the <clears throat> first cataract and the southern frontier of Egypt, to Nubia, to the south, and you have this monument here. It's an incense bowl about this size. It's not big. Um, and it has many of the same motifs associated with kingship that you get in Egypt. So the kingship is then propagated from one polity to another, and also from polities probably from uh, those in southern Upper Egypt to other parts of Egypt, but only 
rather briefly, because then you move to a, con a condition where you have a un unified country. And that is marked quite conveniently by the, uh, the Nama palette, which we have here. So the Nama palette, uh, perhaps next to the um, uh, next to one or two other ancient Egyptian objects is the most famous. Uh, and it shows a king who is about to smite an enemy on the left. And um, on the right, you have a scene of him inspecting a battlefield with many decapitated corpses. Um, most of the conventions that relate to Egyptian kingship are present in this monument. Uh, and uh, at the same time, it probably has uh, cosmic dimensions, which are very important to thinking about kingship in general. The king upholds the cosmos for deities and for people. He stands in the middle between them. Uh, and so uh, the qualities of kingship are associated with this, this intermediary status, intermediary in a positive sense, uh, uh, that he, he is there in order to create order, which we'll come to later. And uh, the cosmic sense is also made active. Um, sorry, I need to look back to check. N none of us can very well see the top of that object. I wonder if I can move this down to the bottom of the screen. Yes. Oh, near the bottom of the screen. <laughs> uh, you have a, a dip in the middle at the top. And that dip is where a bird would perch symbolically, and the bird would be the hawk, which is, embodies the god Horus, who is the tutelary god of kingship. Uh, you've got another image of Horus in front of the king on the left, on the left side, um, with a human arm, and that human arm turns him into a picture of a picture, not a, not a picture of a god because there are very complex rules relating to what you can depict. While well, the, the four cow heads uh, represent the sky. So this is a cosmic object. And so the king is in charge of the cosmos, as you might say. Uh, uh, sorry, that's just highlighting the king's name. So at that point is where the hawk would symbolically descend. And that is the group that I've just mentioned. And then you've got other groups which are already written, uh, which give, identify people. And the, there are two important aspects to the right-hand side, in fact, three. First, uh, you have this scene, which shows king with courtiers and an entourage. Um, <clears throat> and then um, you've got uh, uh, an association, which seems quite well established, that this represents both violence and the idea of sunrise. And so the object would have a cyclical value to it. The, the, the sun, in order to rise, has to kill its enemies. And this is symbolically represented in the scene. Then below that, you have this pair of fabulous animals who are enclosing a circle. The circle is where you, you would grind a pigment and the pigment would be there in order to enliven the recipient of the pigment, somebody's face, uh, whether that is a statue or a person or whatever. It's never been used. It's uh, symbolic. <clears throat> but we do have such <clears throat> pigmented uh, pigment carriers in this, this drawing here. And um, you can see there is um, in the middle that these have been used. <clears throat> that they have this symbol, the ka, um, which is, signifies, among other things, the transmission of power uh, or of the transmission of vital qualities down the generations. And so that is presumably achieved through uh, the use of pigments. Uh, and this points to the importance of ritual in these contexts. You have other examples which lack the, that feature, and they're the large majority. So this is a privilege to have this car element. The privilege is a royal privilege, as you see from this other example here, where the hands are present again. And then you have three hieroglyphs at the top, which are life, duration, and power. 
and those are uh, ones associated exclusively with kingship. But that, again, like the knife, is not from a royal tomb. It's from a, a non-royal tomb and presumably is a royal gift. It, too, has never been used. And this tradition then disappears, but we'll have one more example in a bit. <clears throat> so now that, that was all kind of giving you a background to how kingship can be viewed from a very early date. Um, and here, <clears throat> as I say, I can give you a definition, but it's not a definition of kingship we could use in other parts of the world because it's defining a kingship, a king, through what he is said to be in an Egyptian text. And then we have the, um, these other themes I'll come, come to very briefly. So here you have a rock relief, <coughs> which um, has um, a two and a half lines of inscription underneath, and that's what we're looking at. And um, now I need to move that wretched thing again so that you can see what's written at the bottom. There we are. Uh, so uh, the king has five titles uh, in the full form, and they're all present on the first two lines of that inscription. The third line is a date. Um, so the, <clears throat> the king is a bull. We, uh, if you saw on the palette, the, at the bottom, in the bottom register, that was a bull that represented the king. Uh, the king appears. Um, he's perfect of appearance. So they, as time goes along, of course, you have to find ever new forms uh, of words to give king's distinctive names. <clears throat> so you don't want to go into too much detail as to what these names mean, because they're often variants of one another. And you are enduring of kingship. So there is not only a concept of king, but of kingship, an abstract noun. And um, there is also a concept of the office, which we have in plenty of texts and people will inherit the office. So the office and the holder of kingship are distinct. Um, and uh, then the third name <coughs> appears to be something to do with aspects of power, uh, but it's, it's pretty uncertain. The fourth uh, name is, let's highlight something. This doesn't always work. Uh, Well, I have highlighted something, but it hasn't worked for some reason. Uh, we'll, let's, let's not worry. Um, but you have here in the middle line, you've got two. I think you clicked on the interface. Oh, very good. Uh, if, if you can go back. That's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I still can't highlight it. Yes. Uh, yes. So the highlighted elements are the king's cartouches, identified already in the 18th century as probably containing names of kings. <clears throat> and so the first cartouche name um, is how the king is known during his reign. Uh, and uh, that is, uh, in, in this case, you can translate it. it. It's very cumbersome in English, the enduring one of the manifestations of Re. But of, this is significant because the Re, the sun god, is manifested in the king. And then you've got the king's birth name which we don't need to translate, uh, which is followed in this case by epithets. So those are the five titles that define an Egyptian king. But if you wanted a definition of kingship uh, as such in general, you'd have to look up the usage of that word for kingship, which is the same as one of the two basic words for king, but in a different form. And here, uh, so this is now giving, I think, more or less what I've just said in more uh, abstract form, um, a sort of commentary. Uh, and so the fourth title, I translate dual king. Uh, it's very often translated king of upper and lower Egypt, the two halves of Egypt. Uh, but these um, terms refer to aspects of kingship. And there's a hierarchy between them. And also the, the second of those two terms, Viti, uh, seems to refer strongly to the past, so traditions of kingship. Uh, and uh, as I say, that, say under the last name, you do get many variations there, including people having dynastic names, Ramesses and Ptolemy. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'll move it this way. 
And here we have uh, the element which is very common but was not present um, in the, that the titulary that I happened to choose. And there is the top of a stela, and there you have the king's names, and the, the king is called the perfect god, as it's commonly translated. Uh, but the word perfect um, could be rendered in other ways. The important point is that it's associated with usefulness. And in fact, uh, somebody now 40 years ago suggested that this means minor. Uh, so you have major gods who are what we would call the gods in modern terms, such as the god Amun in that picture. And then you have the king is a minor god, but you can't say he's minor, that wouldn't be right. So instead you say he's perfect. And so the king is somebody who matures into the office as a perfect person. And let's just say something else about that image because that relief is very largely recarved. And this happens on enormous numbers of Egyptian monuments because of the degree of contention around the kingship. And in this case, also around the god Amun. And here is a different statement about the role of the king. This is contemporary with the last image, um, but this is probably a much older text. Uh, and so uh, this is the end of this text. Uh, Ray has placed whatever the king's name may be on the earth of the living forever and ever, judging humanity, propitiating the gods, realizing order and destroying disorder. Uh, so to judge is um, is a prominent feature there, obviously, and to, be, to judge has opposite meanings. Uh, you can judge in order to uh, to render justice, and there are plenty of Egyptian texts which deal with injustice and how justice um, should triumph over injustice. Um, but at the same time, judging involves condemnation. So there's the basic problem of law there, that law is both repressive and uh, positive. Um, and then the vital Egyptian concept of order, ma'at, uh, is um, certainly attested from the second dynasty. We'll have a second dynasty image in a minute. Uh, and uh, ma'at is opposed to disorder. But the basic idea of order is that it exists in an ideal world within the cosmos, but the cosmos means Egypt. It doesn't mean the entire world. And so disorder is cast outside the frontiers of the country. This is a concept that, of course, is by no means unique to Egypt. Um, but the, the idea of ma'at, it definitely has axial qualities, let's say. It is to do with uh, uh, social groups uh, supporting one another and things of that sort, but it also has negative sides, which unfortunately the main publication on them forgets about. And then you have the, the next couplet gives you the status of the king in the cosmos, as you might say, the, there are the gods, there's the king, and there are the dead, the spirits, to whom offerings must be made, and human beings come last. Uh, and that is, of course, again, common to many visions of the cosmos. Uh, I think uh, we can leave the second set of, uh, of verses. They're not so relevant to what we're talking about. But let's just add one point in case I forget it. And that is that uh, in addition to the, the word ma'at, deeply associated with law, uh, there is also another Egyptian word for law, uh, which I won't talk about in any detail. But this refers to issuing edicts and things of this sort, which mainly come from the king. Uh, and uh, so, and you can talk about what is according to this word for law, uh, but uh, the edicts are often about relatively trivial matters, let us say. They're not about the profound moral qualities of the system of law or anything like that. There is also a very developed legal tradition in Egypt, but it's not relevant to today, I'm afraid. Um, I'm now wanting to say a little bit about the king in relation to the gods, and that relief that I have here, dates the third dynasty, um, I just 
put enlarge that image, it's actually quite a small object because it's so beautiful. But here we have the context, and um, you can't see it because of that bar that gets in the way. But at the top, you've got crucial features, which you can see in the line drawing below. We'll actually, we can move to the next uh, image. But uh, here, the, the point that the king is junior and subordinate to the gods becomes very clear. This is a shrine, which contained probably a statue of a deity. Uh, it's only in tiny fragments. And the, there were reliefs of the gods all around it and probably a figure of the king, but that particular feature is uh, only very fragmentary. Uh, no, certainly an image of the king, sorry. Uh, and the gods are doing what they do in writing in all later periods. Uh, and you, you can now see what that is, but you can't see the highlighting that I wanted to have. So let's go back for a moment. Uh, at the top of each column in that line drawing, uh, each column that's surrounded by lines, you have a word meaning speech, uh, a group meaning speech. And so this is a speech by the gods. And indeed, it's in the first person plural. And then you have, in addition, this you will be able to see, uh, you've got this uh, abstract statement, a giver of life, duration, and power, the same set of attributes that I mentioned earlier, uh, given to the king by these gods. And so um, there is the, uh, what the, the gods say. And the crucial point, in a way, is at the bottom there, um, because it says we've caused that he should perform these festivals. And that means his kingship should endure. Um, and we have, we, things we have done for him in exchange. And so there is an exchange, that, that there is a kind of uh, the word exchange is actually present. Can I use the cursor? Yes, here. Uh, showing that the reciprocity between the deities and the king is a very important idea. But the king is, uh, is not a world, um, uh, a world conqueror in, in the, because he is subordinate to the gods. He is a conqueror, certainly, but in a more limited way. So here we go back. That This is a couple of generations earlier than the last picture. And you have contention about kingship through inscriptions of kings. Um, and uh, you've got a statue, which is the oldest statue of a king, which is reasonably well preserved. Um, and uh, then you've got top right, there's a seal, or rather a reconstructed ceiling, which you can see translated at the bottom. And the god Seth, uh, the god of Ombos Makada is the, the, you have an antagonistic period, pair of gods, Horus and Seth. And uh, in this king, Per Ibsen, uh, had um, Seth as his god. He was unique in this respect. Uh, and the king in the statue is his opponent, his opponent, Ha Sechem, who then changed his name to Ha Sechem Wi. You've got that written on, in the caption. Um, and that marked the, uh, the end of struggles over kingship towards the end of the dynasty. Uh, the beginning of the dynasty, there are also clear indications in the naming of kings of, um, of a lot of conflict. Um, and here you've got the institutionalization of conflict, conflict perpetuation of conflict in those drawings around the base of the statue which show a colossal number of uh, people killed in battle, and then these uh, spread eagle corpses all around. It's a more vivid image than we actually ever get later. Uh, but you shouldn't believe the statistics. Uh, and you should never believe statistics about, uh, about military matters anyway. Uh, but then we can, we can sort of um, transfigure that's the type of point that we've had here to a more general view in this next image. I'll have a detail in a moment, um, which shows King Sahure hunting. So hunting is a central activity of kings in expressing the idea of maintaining order. Uh, you maintain order against 
animals their uh, other animals um, rather than maintaining it against your your enemies because animals um, are more expendable and less difficult to deal with. Uh, but you do this on the grandest possible scale and the court is represented both uh, at the bottom of that relief in with many people and behind the figure of the king where the upper elite is shown. Sorry, I do highlight that, those two areas. And this was fantastically important. Um, the uh, the total size of this relief was up to 30 meters long. Uh, this was taken extremely seriously. But then if you can th think about Louis the 15th of France, who spent three days a week hunting, uh, you have a continuation of similar practices in relation to kingship. So there you just have details from this same relief. And uh, just to show the staggering quality of this work, you can go to Berlin and see the originals. And here you've got a drawing which will just pick up on one other point we've been talking about, uh, two other points, sorry, that's his successor, who the relief there was changed to show the successor. Uh, so um, from that you gather that who would succeed was not a foregone conclusion. And uh, this particular person became the successor, but the relief has been altered and you can't tell whether the same person was depicted there before the change was made or not. And then you've got the king's name. So you've got there the hawk on the enclosure. And that, as you can see, has the car sign that I talked about earlier, holding it up. And the, this Horus name can be called the car name. So this is this name represents the idea of the descent of kingship from one one ruler to another, and it also confers benefits. And you can also think about Ernst Kantorovich here, uh, the idea of the king's two bodies. Uh, so the king in Egypt doesn't have two bodies in the sense that you have that in medieval Europe, but he definitely has an uh, uh, avatar or whatever you might call it, this car element, which is depicted in dozens, maybe hundreds of examples. In this case, it's very emblematic, but it has human hands, uh, and it's, uh, the human hands are holding the sign for life, which is given to the king, and also a feather. That feather could stand for Maat, but it could also, unfortunately, stand for other things, so I won't commit myself there. Well, um, what about what kings think and do? And we have this warning uh, passage I've taken from an article uh, to illustrate the problems that what we know about kings, what they did and kingship is within the framework of decorum, as um, Susanna Bekel puts this. Uh, so uh, the material that I'm using is all utterly conventionalized and the individual motivations and things of that sort cannot be taken from it. Um, in 90% at least of cases. We have to be very careful, but we also have to think that kingship is an activity of a group and not just of an individual. And indeed, reading on my phone about change of government in Britain yesterday, of course, uh, one of the articles, which I didn't read, was about who all the advisors are who are going to move in to be the people who support the new ruler, uh, not a king, but never mind, the point is the same. Um, and so here we have a case where a king does something he shouldn't. It's very rare to find a text like this. Um, and this is a block of stone from a non-royal person's tomb, but it's in the form of a royal, uh, as the, if a king writes a letter, it's not called a letter, it's called a decree. Um, and uh, that format of a horizontal line with the king's name in it at the top, and then these vertical columns is standard for royal letters. And it's adapted also for non-royal ones. Now the highlighted columns there uh, show you what the king did, which he shouldn't have done. He was holding, as part of a ritual, while specially clothed for the ritual, a club, an aggressive weapon of some sort. And inadvertently, he hit his his clothier with this weapon. And uh, so he then said, terribly sorry, I didn't mean to do this. 
uh, I really, um, uh, I, I like him a lot, and uh, this is all unintentional. So you can say that when the king is moving around, his person is charged with power in such to such a degree that if something wrong happens, it has to be reversed. But of course, if the king will go to the trouble of reversing this danger that um, his clothier has got into, and clothier is needless to say an extremely high official, uh, then uh, this is a mark of a favor for this official. And then it was written on this block of stone and it, the rest of the text, which I'm not giving you, says how it was put up as an inscription in his tomb. So it was there for the next world as well as for this world. And so um, every now and then kings do things they shouldn't. But uh, this was a, it's a trivial episode, but it's an important episode because of the danger that's involved in it. And the other thing that you notice is it's very carefully marked where people speak, speaking is doing, and um, similarly, uh, you you can enact a law in many uh, in many cultures by pronouncing it, and uh, so that sort of idea is present here too. Now we have what we're going to get as almost the best um, way of thinking about what a king says about his kingship in this example here, um, where. Uh, this stela was set up uh, on the island of Semna, uh, sorry, not on the island of Semna, also on an island nearby, a second copy, uh, in the second cataract of the frontier of Egypt at that date. And there is the stela, and there on the right is a statue of the king found at the same site, and the inscription appears to refer to the statue. Uh, so here we have the crucial passage in the text. Um, as so commonly, uh, the king, uh, not just the king, many people say they are speaking the truth. It mostly means they aren't. Um, and then, as for any son of mine who will enforce this boundary, he is my son, born of my person. Uh, a son who vindicates his father is a model enforcing the boundary of his begetter. But as for the one who will neglect it or will not fight for it, he is no son of mine, not born to me. Um, and then the crucial point for the context is in the last triplet. Uh, my person has caused an image of my person, but maybe that statue, to be made at this boundary so that you will enforce it and fight for it. It's as if the personnel who manned the fortress in which this was had to kind of swear allegiance to the cause of Egyptian kingship and colonialism indeed. Uh, but uh, so there you have something which says who is not a fit king is somebody who will not maintain the traditions of its predecessor. And at the same time, he is not his son. He was not born to him. So the idea of succession through birth is actually contradicted by this statement. You're only born to somebody if you behave properly. Uh, and so birth is very much relativized by that. You have endless examples of kings being called uh, the son of the king's body, the, in other words, the truly begotten son of the king. Uh, but um, probably many of these will be assertions rather than facts. And there, here we have um, a more or less contemporary um, instruction text. Sorry, I should say with that text that certain some of the phrasing in it, is it can be paralleled in instructions. So this was a literary formulation which would have been around in the society, in the elite society of the time, not just at the frontier. Uh, and here you have uh, this literary text, which is almost exactly the same date or inscribed at the same date uh, on a non-royal stela. Um, and so the king and the king is then made, said to be sustenance and plenty. He is identified with these meta persons, in other words, personifications of values. Um, and uh, the second triplet in that passage there gives you the idea of power, and um, but in this case related to being promoted by the king. So it's very pragmatic, shall we say. The king also takes on the role of deities. So the king can get 
um, very near to being a god, but he's not a god in, at least in the, uh, in the sense of the god that we're used to from other gods of other traditions. So uh, now, what about how people attack the king? Uh, or how you vary the image of the king. First, we have an example from uh, the second intermediate period. Uh, and it, at this date, uh, we're not yet at a state of divided kingship, we think, but we can't be sure. Uh, but we are at a state where there are many, many kings. So this 13th dynasty lasted perhaps about 120 years and had about 50 or 60 kings. It's extremely unlikely that all of them died in their beds. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> the same, as, uh, it's as bad as being a Roman emperor, you could say. Um, and uh, so what you normally have is the idea that the king descends from the gods. So you've got a dual possibility of um, descent, of uh, fictitious descent your mother uh, slept with the creator god in who took on the form of uh, your predecessor to beget you uh, or um, you you have other sorts of descent but in this case here is the king and that he has a standard teaching rate and that perfect god um, epithet is there, it's a very much abbreviated titulary, but at the same time, further left, there are two women on the upper register who are both wearing attributes of queenship. Uh, and so, um, uh, and the, the second one has the title, uh, important titles, which relate to uh, uh, also wearing a crown. Um, and hence, uh, she should be uh, the, the mother of a king who is a king through descent, but this is very probably not the case. This is idealized. In addition, you have all sorts of other members of the family depicted on the lower register. Uh, so uh, you can uh, just move away from the idea that kings have to be unique and should not succeed until their parents have died and things of that sort. And that, uh, in particular, this man, whom I haven't highlighted, this man here, uh, is quite possibly the father of the king because he, um, sadly, restored by the modern editor, it says God's father, which can mean father of the king. Uh, so uh, the fictions of descent are therefore overcome by reality. Uh, here's another way to deal with a king you don't like. And um, Khufu, uh, the creator of the Great Pyramid, was much disliked by Egyptians of later periods. And that idea gets into the Greek historian Herodotus. Um, uh, and uh, you can see that if you were a tourist guide of the days of Herodotus, you would think that the person who put up that enormous structure was clearly a tyrant who despised people. Uh, we have, we can't say anything real about this. But what we can say is that that was an ancient tradition by the time of Herodotus. So the pyramid is about 2500 BCE. Um, this tale we have here is about 1600. Um, and so it's a set of stories about um, uh, how uh, at the court of Khufu, the king was bored one day. And so he then got his sons to come and tell stories about the past and about p past kings. Uh, the last story is the one we have on screen here, because uh, Hordjedef says, you know, um, it's no use having these stories about previous kings. They're probably all made up. Uh, so you want, to have a, you want to have somebody of today so that you can see what is real. This, these are all magicians. And so... Uh, and he tells him about this man called Jedi, uh, who can do all sorts of things um, and is 110 years old. And uh, so his person said, yourself then, or Jedef, my son, you will bring him to me. Now, that translation there is in deliberately bad English because the Egyptian is bad. Uh, and uh, again, you have a difference 
Hojedev speaks proper Egyptian in the next in the next little bit of speech, and then his person said, "Go bring him to me." Again, very informal speech. Uh, further down, his person said, "How is it, Jedi, that I have not seen you before?" And Jedi is somebody who is not in awe of anyone, including the king. He says, "If you don't ask me to come, you don't expect me to be here, do you?" Uh, I'm paraphrasing, and. Then, finally, the last line that's there at the bottom is in totally ungrammatical Egyptian. Um, and uh, so uh, this is about, uh, it's a very important matter here, but we can't go into detail. It's about how the line of kings of Khufu will not endure, uh, as later history shows, with all lines of kings, of course. Uh, but that is, as I say, totally ungr ungrammatical. And so the behavior of Hu Fu and his speech show that he is a rough, untutored person who doesn't know, doesn't know what, what he should do. And he also says, um, so Jedi is said to be able to put the head back, uh, a severed, replace a severed head. So Hu Fu says, well, bring us in a prisoner and try it out. And um, J.D. says, no, you shouldn't do it to a human being. So he's even morally reproved. Uh, so you can have a text like this, which is about a king of a thousand years earlier, very conveniently. But kings can be mocked in all sorts of ways. And kings can also, of course, be mocked by the treatment of their monuments. So here you have the very heavily reconstructed uh, mortuary temple of um, king Hatshepsut, the female king, as I put there, because uh, Hatshepsut took on the role of king while she was the um, the guardian of and co-regent of Tutmosis III. Well, she was first the guardian or regent, shall we say, of Tutmosis III. She then became the co-regent and took full kingly status. Uh, and But this was not a long-term success. Uh, we don't know if she died in her bed. It's perfectly possible she did. But um, memory was not kind to her. And so here you have reliefs in that temple. The left-hand one is completely erased. And uh, that would have been a figure of Hatshepsut. We know that because the protective vulture comes above figures of kings. And then the right-hand image there just shows you that that's by no means the only erasure that you get here and how very complicated this all is, because that is a figure of on the right of Tutmose III, of her co-regent. But the figure of the god there has been erased because of later religious disputes. Uh, and the other thing to say is that uh, Hatshepsut was very clever, and this was not completely overcome, uh, the frieze above the left-hand scene show, is a monogram of her name. Uh, but part of that has been erased to, uh, to remove her memory. And here are three statues of Hatshepsut from the site. And they're all in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Uh, and unfortunately, the Metropolitan took it on itself to put them back together. But they had all been smashed. And so the right hand one of those three gives you a more genuine impression of what the, of the state these statues were in after Hatshepsut's memory was erased, probably by her former co-regent Tutmosis III, but maybe as much as 20 years after her death. But the left hand image is important here because that shows her as a woman, but wearing the headcloth of a king, and you can see the other two figures have the same headcloth. Uh, so you, there was no exclusive presence of, uh, of men among kings. Women could also be kings. And indeed, Professor Stefan, Stefanovich will talk about this tomorrow. I think tomorrow. <laughs> uh, uh, but other things are then very important to the ideology of kingship in the same temple complex. Uh, uh, the left-hand scene is hardly visible, but that's good in a way. Uh, and the right-hand scene, you can see you've got a figure of the sun god with erased reliefs on either side. 
And on the left, what you have is a pregnant queen uh, who is um, actually largely reconstructed. So there were these scenes to do with the divine birth of the king, which I, I mentioned earlier. Um, and that whole cycle of scenes was erased, except for figures you really couldn't erase, notably figures of the sun god. Uh, and uh, then it was restored under Ramses II. And this is the religious reform of a slightly later king, Akhenaten. We see an image of him in a minute. But let's first look at what we can say about succession from one king to the next, because it happens to be from the end of the reign of Tomoze III. Uh, so there is um, a tomb owner, Amenemhab, on the right, presenting his life story to Tukmose the third. Complete fiction, Tukmose the third was dead. Uh, but the crucial passage is here, and can we try to move this again, or are we going to have trouble? Uh, so uh, that is the formula which describes King dying. Um, and uh, he was born up to the sky. This, that's a little bit transcendentalist, we could say, and joined with the sun disk, the divine flesh merged with the one who created it. And then dawn the next day, and let's pray that I can move the image on, but how did you manage to get this to work? Ah, wait. That looks promising down there. There we are. Yes, but no, uh, I've moved too far. It's okay. Uh, it is there. Sorry. Uh, you then got the immediate continuation of the text that the next morning, uh, that is Amenhotep II, um, was seated on the throne and mastered the lordship. Um, and he did various violent things. So kingship is defeating your enemies at the same time, but succession is instantaneous. So any idea that you have from all these other traditions that you have these periods before a king appears, uh, is, it's contradicted here, and that passage, as you can see, has a precise date to the day. That's obviously very important. Um, but we can also say, of course, that in traditions of other, uh, indeed France again, since I mentioned Louis XV, I might mention 16th century French kings who had a mortuary cult between their death and their burial. Uh, and so uh, in other traditions, this problem of continuity uh, until the point of burial of the predecessor is also important. Uh, here is Akhenaten, uh, Amenhotep IV, and three colossal statues of him. So here's the radical reformer who uh, did, <coughs> abolishes in particular the cult of the god Amun and one or two other deities and worships only a specific aspect of the sun god. Uh, the, I don't want to go into detail on that, but just to say that uh, this was a very radical move which involved the erasures of figures of the gods. We saw an example already, two examples, and then it was all restored in the following period. These colossal statues of him are totally outside Egyptian traditional conventions, but they were smashed uh, very soon afterwards. So um, people had no pity on the memory of Akhenaten. He was called the enemy uh, in, uh, in texts that survived from slightly later periods. And the years of his reign appear to have been counted to his predecessor in history. People would rewrite history also by erasing rulers. They didn't want or whole periods from the narrative. And um, in the case of Hatshepsut, she's not included in lists of kings, but you could argue that's not very significant because Tutmose the third was king before Hatshepsut proclaimed herself king, so she was just a phase within his reign. That's a bit ambiguous, I think. Uh, but here we get to the restoration after Akhenaten, and so you have here the, the, the stela in which this is proclaimed, and as you can see, people were going to reuse it for other purposes. Um, you've got the scene at the top where the, the erasure of the gods is made very clear in retrospect by 
those passages I highlight, the word gods occurs four times in those captions at the top. So plurality of gods is extremely important. The bottom of the stela, at the bottom on the left, uh, shows you the people uh, in uh, abbreviated form as lapwings are adoring the king. So this is something that includes society as a whole. Uh, and uh, so here is what it says. And here we actually, I've forgotten this, uh, we have the word law, to, since we're in the law faculty here, on the second line here. Uh, so you, it's quite rare to have the word for law in King's titularies. Why it's present for Tudankhamun, I wouldn't like to say. Tudankhamun did not have a happy afterlife, uh, because as you can see, his name is in square brackets, because it was erased on the stela by his second successor. Um, and then I've put in blue the names of Amun-Re, Reharachte, Ptah, the three principal gods of uh, the country, who are then highlighted. We'll see this in a second. Um, but um, then you have a, a narrative about how uh, at his birth uh, that he was begotten by, uh, by the god, which of course was not the case, and everyone knew that. Uh, there are these two trumpets which come from the tomb of Tutankhamun with the same group of three gods, and the three gods seem to have military significance as being the di divisions of the Egyptian army. So there's a distinct militaristic characteristic to this. Uh, well, when Tutankhamun came to the throne, uh, everything was in a disastrous state. The temples had fallen into ruin and people would walk through the temple complexes, which is terrible. Uh, uh, and uh, then the symbolism of this, if you sent an expedition abroad, it did not succeed. If you prayed to a god or a goddess, and note that both are given, um, you didn't get any response. So uh, the, the pact between the king and the gods and the king and the people failed. Then, Tutankhamun comes along, restores all the temples, and the gods are put back in the temples, and everyone is happy. And that is expressed by the latter part of the text. And so there you have the closest you're going to get to a, a criticism of a previous ruler. It doesn't name the ruler. So there are strict limits to what you can do uh, in a public context. Well, public is very relative, of course, because these things are put up in temples that, and most people can't read anyway. Um, so then I've just got a few non, uh, it, uh, couldn't have pictures here, um, just mentioning examples of where in other types of sources you can see criticism of kings. Uh, the most severe one is really the first. Uh, as for Pharaoh, how can he reach this land, it's not clear whether that means Nubia or Thebes, but the king would reside in the delta in that period, so a very long way away. And whose master is he in any case? So people, uh, this is written by the kind of local ruler of Thebes in that period. Um, uh, but he is quite happy to write to somebody else saying the king's not worth anything, we can do what we want. And then you have the use of kingship as um, a negotiation point in the next example, where um, you've got a, a, a robbery of a king, and the first person says, well, never mind. And the second person says, he was a good king, and he did many great things. Uh, and so people will have a discussion, which also is a kind of historical one about the status and value of kings. Then you have, uh, um, that, that is a factual text. Uh, we don't have to believe everything it says, but it's a report, it's not a literary text. Uh, the next one, When Amun, is a very literary text. Uh, but in this case, um, When Amun says about an earlier king that he was just a man, uh, whereas what I'm offering you is the blessings of my God. And so there is a clear separation between kingship and gods in this case. Finally, you have this tale, which is in a manuscript of the second half of the first millennium, where um, a there is a king who is clearly a very bad person, 
and who will sacrifice somebody else because he's afraid he's going to die. Um, but we don't have the end of this, so we don't know what the resolution was. Uh, but we have other examples of kings facing up to reality. Uh, here you have um, Pie, Pianchi, a very famous text from Sudan. Um, and the important point about this, I can't go into detail of the narrative, which is enormous, but you have here the scene at the top of the stela, uh, both photograph and a drawing. And um, you've got the, the figure of the king. This is, I don't know, a parallel for this. He's facing away from the god. And that must be because he's facing towards the figures on the right and in being intermediary to the god. But it's unique. Um, and then you've got a king who is standing there uh, holding a sistrum. A sistrum signifies propitiation. He's trying to calm the king uh, by doing that. And he's got a queen in front of him. And then underneath are three more kings. So there are five kings shown on this steeper. And that was the reality of the period. There were many people, many lines of kings in this period. But the king from Sudan, P.A. Pianchi, was the leader of all of them. And then you've got five more people on the left who are not kings, but are in identical poses to three of the kings. So kingship has been relativized to an extraordinary degree at that date. Um, but that didn't last uh, because uh, a couple of generations later, you have a reunification of the country and reassertion of single kingship. Uh, now, the last indigenous dynasty of Egypt is here, the um, 30th, and you have Nectanebo I. And, so, and this gives you something very different. I don't know of any parallel you could have. It. Well, I do know one, but I, I didn't include it for lack of time. Um, so he came to Hermopolis uh, to, on a visit, as you might say, when he was a military officer. And um, I omitted that he found the place was in a terrible state. And so he then um, became king. But there is no criticism of his predecessor there. There's criticism of the state of the place, but not of, the, not of his predecessor, who was another dynasty. Uh, and when he came along, uh, he, uh, he then thought of his visit, and um, the temple was restored. And you have, interestingly, from about 80 years later, you have a prominent non-royal tomb, which goes through similar tropes in talking about restoration of the same place, uh, which shows that you don't know what to think about any of these things. But this is a degree of openness about kingship that you would not have had in earlier periods. And finally, this is my last example. Um, we have here uh, the, what's called the satrap stela. Uh, so this is a stela put up after the conquest of Alexander the Great uh, and before Ptolemy I had proclaimed himself king. It's a period of 27 years. Um, sorry. Uh, I, well, no, that's true. But um, it's, it's 15 years from uh, when uh, the successors of Alexander, uh, the, from the death of Alexander to uh, Ptolemy proclaiming himself king. Now, the interesting feature of this relief is that it shows a king. <clears throat> but the king is anonymous. Uh, and this is because of conventions of representation that you cannot show on a royal monument, <clears throat> one that pr presents the role of the ruler, <clears throat> you cannot show anyone but the king in front of a god. But the, the king has no name because you don't want to talk about him. Uh, and um, uh, hidden by that bar at the bottom of the screen, uh, is uh, the passage <clears throat> where it says, well, it's, you can see it says his name is Ptolemy, but it does mention Alexander IV, uh, who was the second successor of Alexander the Great, his, his young son. And we have a paper another day about Philip III, who was the successor of Alexander the Great. Um, and so during this period, you still had somebody who functioned, he had the functions of king, but could not call himself king until 15 years later, he decided that 
this was okay. We don't know what made the change. Uh, but you could not do without the office of kingship, even if you couldn't name the ruler. And that uh, was a convention that happened a lot in the Ptolemaic period because of frequent battles among the ru uh, ruling family and so on. And so that brings us to a period where we've got other people giving papers, and I will finish there. Thank you very much for your patience. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Professor Baines. If there are any questions, please uh, just please turn on the microphones when you speak. And of course, people online the same. You can raise your hand or you can type the question in the chat if you can't speak. Professor Stefanovic, just the microphone. Yeah, good morning to everyone. Well, very important and fantastic lecture, and I could talk for a day on various issues. No, but just a tiny comment. Um, well, it's a very complex system between the realm of humans, realm of gods, and king between these two worlds. And at least this has been my impression always that with Amarna, this very fragile system collapsed completely with king becoming more God or issuing on earth more as a divine child of Aton. And that the restoration coming after Amarna, in fact, never managed to put the things back as it was in the golden age of the old kingdom, for example. And one episode which is very vivid for me in this direction, and I might be very wrong, I don't know, is the Kadesh battle, for example, when the king, Ramses II, the great one, is trapped in his tent, and we have the situation that Amon is coming himself to save the king. This is very unique, I think. We didn't have this in a previous period. The king himself, with his divine power, should be able to solve the question. But in this case, we somehow are seeing the supremacy of the god. And with this decline, I think, starting with after Amarna, we are facing all these examples you are showing to us in the later period, where kings somehow need to confront with political reality, with... Um, uh, uh, fragmentation of the country, with foreign influence, with individual actions like with Venamun, mm -hmm. and not being able completely to restore their divine order on earth. Well, as I said, I might be very wrong, but somehow this is my impression. I I would agree with uh, uh, I think of uh, your general point very much. Uh, I think the problem uh, we have is in a sense that the boundaries of convention change and uh, with Akhenaten and that, that so uh, when Ramses II does exactly what you say, is he, um, is he entertaining new ideas or is the, the facade of kingship changing? Uh, and that, that is what it's so difficult to know. Um, the, you, there's an interesting question that arises from this because you have cases uh, when Tukmas the third, so in the period when you uh, have things differently a few generations earlier, he goes on campaign and uh, when he wakes up in, the, in his tent on campaign in the morning, it says that he's in the palace. So that symbolically speaking, the kingship is transportable wherever the, the king is. But does the king also transport his gods? Um, now, we certainly know a lot about the transport of gods in the ancient Near East, but very little in Egypt. Uh, but when Amun does say that he took his god Amun to Biblos with him, uh, and I think it's possible that the Egyptian gods went on campaign too, in the form of portable statues, uh, but uh, we simply don't have any mention of it, and it's, I might be wrong. Uh, but so, but presumably in Ramses's case, he's uh, he's emphasising the distance involved and things like that, and I. I 
as you say, you don't have anything like that from earlier. And it, Ramses II is doing the same sort of thing as non-royal people do in, in the same period, but also actually before Amarna, they are displaying their piety visibly. So I, I don't know myself to what extent there, there is a complete change. In the case of Akhenaten, um, there's also one little problem, which is that he, um, he asserts that he's the only one who knows about his God, and uh, so everything has to pass through him. But there are one or two texts which show that this was not the way other people took it. Uh, and so um, it's always possible that uh, the, well, the <clears throat> difference between the notion that the king is the protagonist of humanity before the gods uh, is, is never absolute, it's relative, shall we say. But it's certainly, uh, Akhenaten did a tremendous amount to make this more problematic. Any more questions? If not, I might use the opportunity myself, though it might be slightly off topic, but you mentioned the issue of math, and you said there were many interesting legal aspects, but that, that's not quite the subject, but a lot of us being lawyers here, I find that interesting. So could you elaborate on that a little bit, or maybe tell us a little more about the function of the symbolism of math in conjunction with the ruler? Well, that, <clears throat> that's a really difficult question. Um, there is a book, a, a famous book about Maat, um, which I think idealizes the, the issues perhaps a bit too much. But um, I think it's important to say that uh, Maat uh, means both um, order, uh, and so order in the most general and positive sense, uh, and it also means truth. And so, uh, the, and truth is obviously a very important legal concept. And so, I think the idea of truth is central to how Egyptians see uh, or see order, and that obviously has ethical dimensions. Uh, but as I said, I think that people tend to neglect that placing order in place of disorder is something which is actually about assertion of your frontiers and things like that, which are not so uh, so simply positive values. Um, now, when um, so uh, if you then have a, if you come before a tribunal, there is some sort of a legal case, then the idea of Maat is present. And uh, you have uh, so the winner in a case is somebody who is given mahat, who is given what is right. They, they win, let's put, put it crudely. Um, and so that's deeply uh, involved in, in this life, as far as we can tell, with the reservation, which will be true of many, most legal systems, that in practice, the resolution of conflict through law is very often a matter of negotiation and compromise, not of anything absolute. Um, but at the same time, it has next worldly dimensions too. So that uh, if you, when you die, uh, you confront the tribunal of the next world, and that, and then you uh, you have to assert forty two things that you didn't do, which were wrong. Um, and 42 must be a very important number, but we don't know why. Um, and uh, then you are said to be true of voice. So in some way, a voice has proclaimed that uh, you are, you are, uh, you're, you're not just saying the truth, but you are also a, a good person. So uh, Maat has all sorts of ramifications. At the same time, if you want to summarize how, how, the order of the world relates to the wider cosmic order, then that is done through Ma'at. And so uh, if you have a single offering which might stand for what the cult of the gods means in a temple, you can offer a figurine of Ma'at. 
uh, and, uh, and th there are plenty of scenes showing that. Uh, you also have people who wear an amulet uh, as a necklace, uh, on a necklace, uh, which is a figure of Ma'at, uh, and that's really going very much the boundaries of accepted symbolism, I think. So the highest official of the country, the, uh, the vizier, as we conventionally call it, uh, it, is entitled to wear this symbol of Ma'at, and he is also somebody who dispenses justice. Uh, but again, this justice is so often a matter of compromise and so on. So there's a very complex range of associations with Ma'at, which certainly has a tremendous amount to do with law. I think you could say it perhaps has more to do with law than this other word, hep, which I mentioned, but um, which is the word that's normally translated as law. Um, the, the, well, I'm not a specialist in Egyptian law, but uh, the, there are all sorts of interesting things you can do with it too, of course. <laughs> Thank you very much. Do we have any more questions? Professor Monter? I would be willing to uh, simply offer a comment to Professor Baines and uh, the introduction, which is not yours, but the idea of um, metapersons yeah. as uh, one of the necessary attributes of a proper ruler, and that this is something that is um, it, that's a helpful term, I hope, to us because it will resumed again tomorrow morning in a slightly different form. Um, and I think it is, you know, something that is, to what extent the practice of law can be, today can be com understood with, uh, or how you can deal with many persons and it is very awkward. Thank you very much for that. I, I, I find this is a very useful term. Uh, I've, as it happens, this book of Marshall Silence that I showed you the title page of, I only have the PDF so far, and I don't like reading PDFs. Uh, uh, but um, uh, he, ha uh, he has a whole chapter on metapersons, and it's very entertaining to read the first part of it, because he gives you all sorts of um, examples of uh, meta persons uh, uh, being in the language of today's newspapers, let's say, uh, so that the, you have all these bodies. The judiciary would be a good one, uh, which could be seen as a meta person. And so uh, he remarks that uh, this is in a in a transcendentalized world of today, where we don't believe these meta persons uh, are active, but uh, they're still intrinsic to our language. Uh, but he's thinking that a pre-modern or pre-transcendental world would have the same sorts of metaphorical existence, but these will then be active, uh, actively engaged beings in a way that they aren't so much for us now. So um, by the way, um, that book, I believe, is a free download for those who want to find it. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you. Anyone else? If not, it's about the time to take a break. So thank you very much once again, Professor Baines. We take a break until 11 o'clock and then we continue with our first session. Wow.